Well, if you go carefully into the textbook of psychiatry, you're going to see that there are two major depressive disorders. One is called major depressive disorder, and to diagnose it, there should not be substance abuse. And the other, which is when you have a substance abuse, is called substance-induced mood disorder with <coughs> depressive symptoms. They are identical. Presentation is identical. You go through some suffering trauma, genetic predisposition, your limbic system fail, and you get a disease, major depressive disorder. But when you develop the disease of addiction, you incorporate the limbic system, which is going to basically manifest exactly with the same symptoms. So substance-induced mood disorder with depression, substance-induced mood disorder with anxiety, substance-induced psychotic disorder, substance-induced mood disorder with bipolar or manic <coughs> symptoms are called that way because the treatment is totally different. Let me give you a medical example. I go to see a medical doctor because I have fever, I'm not eating, I'm losing weight, and I'm feeling very weak. He says, maybe you're getting depressed. Yeah, but I mean, this fever and this malaise, like I'm getting sick. Let me give you some aspirin for that. Patients start taking aspirin, feels much better, and the doctor says, Great, keep taking your aspirin, you're much better now. So the physician is treating the symptoms, but he didn't do a proper evaluation covering all the biopsychosocial to find out what is happening here. Uh, three months later, the patient died when he started coughing blood and he died. He has tuberculosis, and the initial symptoms are low-grade fever, loss of appetite, malaise, tiredness and fatigue. So we're doing the same thing with addiction. We're treating the symptoms by not doing the proper assessment, putting the wrong diagnosis, and treating the patient in a way that will favor denial. Because I'm not an addict, I am depressed. And the negative emotional affect that I'm talking about, negative emotional state, negative affect, is the normal reaction when you finally stop using drugs because your brain now is changing and it wants more dopamine basically. So the situation is that instead of treating addiction the way it is, we are making it a psychiatric disease. It's been treated mostly by primary care physician. Are psychiatrists properly trained to treat and manage addiction? Are primary care physician trained in that area? No. But it's because of the misconception with carry on with the disease that it is a social problem because of stupid kids who are doing drugs. So patients get exposed to antidepressants, antipsychotics, stimulants, benzos, benzos, and all of these medications that they're getting are going to worsen addiction. That's finally proven. So when a kid who is having an addiction, is struggling with it, wants to stay sober, is depressed because his life has no meaning at all, is given an antidepressant, he will feel a little better initially because his serotonin level is going to go up. This is controversial, but Antidepressants don't cure depression because they only increase serotonin. Depression can have high, low, or normal serotonin. We don't know exactly what is major depressive disorder. There is a beautiful social definition that it is the punishment from the brain where you don't accomplish what you're supposed to do. Although we have cases of endogenous depression. Successful people with no problem in life, very, very successful in all spheres, and they end up becoming depressed without reason. But most episodes of major depressive disorder are situational, I call it existential, or triggered by something. And that kind of depression usually is triggered by your sub 
unconscious brain telling you, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. The memory is filled with this. You have to finish college, high school. You have to go to college. You have to get a degree. You have to get married. You have to have kids. You have to be able to do that in order to get happy. They fail to accomplish those things. They're not happy. So they look for happiness in an artificial way by satisfying not what you have to do, <coughs> but the area of the brain that makes you feel good if you do those things. So the use of antidepressants, especially when you use high dose and chronically, are going to artificially increase serotonin. And serotonin accumulates massively in this area of the brain. So it changes, it. It changes your judgment. It makes you feel like you don't care. Now, if I don't care about my failure in life, I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to worry. I'm going to sleep like a baby. I'm going to be fine, even though I'm flipping hamburgers and living in poverty. That sadness, that depressive state, seems to be the way nature said you got to do it the right way. I see that in animals. Animals get into some sort of difficult situation, they look pretty depressed. My little dog broke her back. I find out because she looked quite depressed and she didn't want to get out of the chair, under the chair. She just looked so depressed. She was not eating, doing nothing. I said, something is wrong with her. She broke her back. I said, this is a clinical depression, what I'm seeing here. She got fixed, she's fine. She just went back to her usual soul. So the idea is that when they get exposed to these medications, something's gonna go wrong in the brain. Briefly, it's 11. Antidepressants, they increase serotonin in the brain. This is gonna make the brain disinhibit. What is that? I wanna socially do things that my primitive brain tell me to do that I shouldn't do. So serotonin in my free prefrontal cortex when it is normal, hold me from doing it. But if I get too much serotonin prefrontally, I start doing things that I shouldn't be doing. So you're more prone to do things that you know you should not do, like using drugs. So you increase impulsivity, the tendency to overreact, the tendency to be more prone to do things that you shouldn't be doing. But serotonin going up in the prefrontal cortex is like a tremendous alarm for the brain. And the brain failed to bring it down. You cannot bring down serotonin when you're taking a chemical that is preventing the brain from destroying serotonin. So after several months, the brain says, we cannot do this. It says, okay. Sadly, it says, shut down dopamine. We cannot have high dopamine with high serotonin. You want to know what the people with high serotonin and dopamine are? They're in jail. And I know a ton of them. I work, I work in detention. So the brain shut down dopamine because dopamine can make you impulsive. Dopamine can make you focus into doing things that you want to do when you are disinhibited. So the brain shut it down. So you shut down dopamine in an addict and they're gonna start craving like hell, restless and anxious, unable to focus or concentrate, they're gonna be called ADD. And now they're gonna get a stimulant, which is a dopamine drug. That's gonna to contribute to their tolerance, and now they're gonna need more drugs. I have a case, it's here. I have never seen something like that. He was put as a kid on stimulants from age 6 to 16. At 16, he told the parents, I'm not taking that medication again, period. I don't want to use that. He said he hated it, he felt horrible on it, and he felt like he doesn't have any motivation or desire to do things. Tolerance. So he stopped it. And a year later, he was an IV heroin abuser, 20 to 30 bags a day. Were you getting high? No, I just was feeling normal. So you were getting it from the adult, now you're getting it from the heroin. I don't know what happened. I just tried, it didn't work, so I tried more and more and more, and now he's a very severe heroin, heroin addict. 
And he's just 18. He's been doing it for two years. He came for help now. I've never seen something like that. A heroin addict usually is an opiate addict who uses it for several years. Eventually, the, sever the severity of the disease is so that the tolerance is so strong that they have to stop taking the opiates. They have to snort them. Then they have to smoke it. And then they have to inject it. Otherwise, it will not work for them. So basically, the progression in addiction is just a, a way to put more faster in the brain so that I can satisfy this negative emotional state. So low dopamine, high serotonin, magic recipe for relapse. And what I see here, but really in detention in West Palm Beach, is basically 80% of people admitted to the jail are on antidepressants or psychiatric medications, and they do abuse substances, or they socially drink. But one day they drank and they are under the influence of the psychotropic and drinking basically prevent this, the prefrontal cortex from working. Alcohol intoxication allow you to do things that you would normally not do. And he does it by disinhibiting the prefrontal cortex. No, don't flirt with women, you're married. Now you have three drinks in your head and you're flirting with all women around. And you don't understand why you're doing that behavior. But that is a primitive behavior coming from here. We contain it somehow because we are social animals that know we shouldn't be doing that. Please understand that the same way addiction works is the same way infidelity works in male. We have a strong drive to reproduce coming from the Y chromosome. We are XY. That strong drive make us want to have sex. But the primitive brain doesn't care with whom. You know she'll be your wife. But the primitive brain doesn't care. So male are inf infidelity is so prevalent in male because they have a tremendous drive, almost an obsession with cravings and compulsion to have sex. Well, with the wife, but also with other women. And nature favors variety, meaning you don't want it with your wife. You want it with her, 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 and her, and her, and that other one over there also. And this is something that, sadly, women do a very good job with what we call the cues. So what is the problem with addiction? If you expose them to drugs, they relapse. If you expose them to cues, they relapse. And if you expose them to stress, they also relapse. So who doesn't see drugs on a daily basis? Who doesn't be in places where there are drugs? Or who doesn't have stress in life? So this is the problem, achieving relapse. Society is full of these problems. Cues. If I drink, I should not go to a bar. That's a powerful cue that's going to make me relapse. But if I'm an alcoholic, I should not go to my friend's house who has a bottle of alcohol, 10 bottles of alcohol in a little corner. <coughs> and if I'm under a lot of stress, I'm going also to experience significant cravings to improve my well being through the use of drugs. The primitive brain says, you stress? Go for a drink. Get some cocaine, man. That's going to make you feel good. The brain doesn't know. It only knows that that thing, whatever it is, can make you feel good. So it promotes it. So going back to males, when a male goes around, is bombarded by cues from females that he cannot control. <coughs> and the cues in females are so unique, you will not believe it. Women want their lips as pink as possible. Primitive brain knows what that is. She's healthy and she's producing good estrogens. But women want to have big, nice, beautiful boobs. The primitive brain says, that baby is going to be so healthy, man, there's plenty of milk there. And women like to have a good hip and behind. The primitive brain says, 
that baby will be born with no trauma at all. It's unbelievable. It's already established a long time ago. So women enhance those qualities in order to attract more male. But those cues make males more prone to, well, violate boundaries, rape, abuse. A male that cannot reproduce or is rejected, historically is known. They are most of them in jail. They rape. They cannot reproduce. That's the essence of my life. I get rejected. No woman wants to be with me. I'm going to rape one. And that way he can accomplish the number one mission in male. Women is different. Women have a different agenda. They want a reliable, educated, intelligent, non-animal male. Non-animal means good prefrontal cortex that can hold his primitive brain. So he can help me take care of this baby for nine months that I will not be able to work and also help these kids for the rest of my life. So totally different agenda. We will never get along. <laughs> she wants to be quiet with one husband, doing nothing. He wants to be jumping around from town to town and getting a different one. Look at that guy so happy back there. He's <laughs> just looking at me like, you got it. Now, education is so important. Education is so unique that those who got the message, and this works also for addiction, will stop being unfaithful to their wife. Now you know why. Now you know it's an instinct. Now you know it's strong. Now you know you crave. Now you know you're pursuing reproduction. You know you shouldn't. You can get also diseases. So basically, if you really get the message, in this moment, as an insight, you're going to probably say to yourself, oh my God, that's why. And you will not do that behavior, behavior ever again. Sadly, if I say that to people who have no, don't have an addiction, they don't have the motivation to listen to me carefully and be worried about it because they don't have the addiction. I get a lot of attention from the addicts, but it's too late. But again, the more you know about the animal in you and how disease affects you, the better prepared you will be to fight it, to remain sober, and to learn to enjoy again the simple things in life that you have erased from your memory and put it back there.